Holy Lord, praise God. Thank you, Jesus, for all of your blessings over this past year, Lord, for being with us every step of the way, Lord. And we're thankful, Lord, to know that the new year you'll be with us to provide, to produce, and to reveal your goodness, your glory, and all that our hearts desire according to your word, Lord. We look forward with expectation, with great expectation, Lord, for all of the works that you will do in our lives, that we will experience, that we will see manifest. We believe you, Lord, for a great outpouring personally and collectively as a church, believing, Lord, for revelation, for insight, and for blessing in every areas of our life. For that, Lord, we give you thanks right now in advance, Lord, for what you have done, are doing, and what we will experience in Jesus' name. Everybody said praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. Give him a hand clap. Praise God. Amen. God bless all of you for being here this morning. Thank you, Tammy, for opening. That was great. Thank you, Suzanne, Peter, and Tammy for leading us in worship. And thank all of you for sharing. Praise the Lord this morning. It was good. Praise God. Thank the Lord. Hear about the... Uh, Sloth that was uh, walking through the woods. He was attacked by a gang of vicious snails. <laughs> and the snails left him bleeding and confused, and uh, he was finally able to get the strength to go to the police station and report the assault. And the desk sergeant asked him to uh, describe his attackers, and he replied, I don't know what they look like, it all happened so fast. <laughs> Yeah. Snails. Oh. Sloth. Praise the Lord. God's in a good mood. Amen. 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 Merry heart doeth good like a medicine. Amen. You know, when a pig loses its voice, it becomes disgruntled. <laughs> Salute. I'm not done. <laughs> a little boy came to school crying that his pet bird, Juan, had been killed by a golf gun. A golf gun, the confused teacher asked. What's that? He said, I don't know, the sobbing boy answered, but it sure made a hole in Juan. <laughs> <laughs> okay, praise the Lord. Thank the Lord. Amen. So we got a new year coming. Right around the corner and uh, new opportunities for God and new opportunities for us. Praise the Lord. So I want to share a few things with you this morning. I think uh, generally in line with uh, what you were sharing uh, prior to the worship. And uh, So let's, let's just begin. Sheila, if you will, let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And I want to read uh, verses 18 through 31. Again, this morning, I'm going to have some rather lengthy preliminary scriptures here just to kind of set things up. In fact, I've got a lot of scriptures in here today, so Sheila's going to be working really, really hard. She's up to it, though. So, for the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved is the power of God. For it's written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. For the Jews require a sign and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified under the Jews a stumbling block, under the Greeks foolishness. But under them which are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. Yes. 
God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty, and base things of the world, and things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not, to bring to naught things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God has made unto us wisdom, righteousness, and sanctification and redemption, that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. Yes. Praise the Lord. Yes. Amen. Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 through 34. Matthew 6, 25 through 34. Praise the Lord. Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what ye shall eat or what ye shall drink, nor yet for your body, what ye shall put on. Is not the life more than meat, and the body than a raiment? Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather unto barns. Yet your heavenly Father feedeth them, are ye not much better than they? Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit unto his stature? And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which is today, which today is, and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Praise the Lord. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. I was thinking about, uh, oh, the last couple of weeks, actually, it was looking over some uh, textbooks and different things I had. And I, I, I remember in college, if you, if you took psychology, just 101, uh, at least back in the early 70s when I was in school, that you would have learned about Maslow's hierarchy of human needs. And uh, in, in the 40s, there was this guy named Abraham uh, Maslow, and uh, he developed this theory about these particular needs. And uh, he identified a person's basic needs, and they are uh, physiological, safety, love, belonging, esteem, and self-actualization. And he used a pyramid to illustrate them. And uh, the most basic uh, was the physiological. That would have been at the bottom or the base of the pyramid, which is health and food and and sleep, water, you know, the basic things. And then the next level would be shelter and uh, freedom from danger. The next level would be, would be uh, belonging, love, affection, being part of a group, being part of a family. And then the next level would be esteem, like self-esteem or the esteem from others. And finally, at the very top, at the peak of the pyramid, would be uh, self-actualization, which is achieving your individual potential. So these needs, uh, they build progressively. That's why you've got the pyramid is showing them they all are interconnected, uh, that they depend on each other. So for example, it's hard for somebody to develop self-esteem if their physiological needs aren't met. I mean, this is why we have welfare and things that we have because kids that are raised in poverty, that don't have food, that don't have shelter, that, that they end up having issues with self-esteem and all these other things as they get older. This is just, you know, it's, it's psychological stuff, but it's true, you know. It's, so here's the deal. What's this got to do with anything, right? Well, what's interesting for me is that Maslow's observations, most of them anyway, agree with the Bible. So it wasn't just some nutcase psychologist, which many of them are, but this guy actually, whether he knew it or not, was connecting with biblical truths. So, for example, Matthew 6, uh, 31 and 32, which we just read, God's saying basically the same thing. Therefore, take no thought, saying, what shall we eat, what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For all, after all these things do the Gentiles seek for your heavenly Father knows that you have need of all these things. So God knows there, there are physiological needs 
that people have, right. right? As human beings, right? So God knows our physical and our psychological needs are real. They're, they're identifiable, right? right? We'll look at verse 33 then. He says, but seek ye first. Okay, I know you've got these issues. I know you've got these things. But seek first the kingdom of God, and then those things will get taken care of. All of these other psychological and physiological things can be dealt with if you seek the kingdom of God first. Yes. Because we know some people that grow up with all of their physiological needs met, and they've got self-esteem. In fact, they're egotistical and everything else. They've got all these things, but they're total shipwrecks when it comes to being a human being. Right. Because they don't have the one thing that makes all these other things work. Yeah. Amen. So that's what he's saying. Seek first the kingdom of God, his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. So what in addition, God, what God is saying, in addition to these necessities, he's designed us with spiritual needs. Every human being has this inner yes. longing for God, whether they want to admit it or not, or whether they accept it or deny it and say that they're an atheist or an agnostic. There's an inner part of us that longs for this connection just as it longs for acceptance or family or sure. food and shelter and, and deliverance from uh, fear and having safety and all these kinds of things are there they're real right these needs that God's talking about here seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these other things will be added to you those are needs that most psychologists don't acknowledge they don't talk about them. you know they just don't when I came back from uh, Vietnam I got into some trouble and blessed out a, uh, a captain and ended up having to go before the uh, CO of the base, uh, Paris Island, and uh, Colonel Dobratz was his name. And uh, he had some choice words for me uh, because I got into a fight in town and an officer came up to me in civilian clothes. I was in a bar and I came out and he had been in there and got punched. Not necessarily by me, I don't know who hit him, but somebody hit him. And he wanted to get my ID because he knew I was in the military. I mean, all you had to do was look at my hair. This is 1969, you know. I mean, so if you didn't have hair, you were in the service or something was wrong with it. And I refused to give him my ID because he was in civilian clothes. And I said, I don't know who you are. You could be anybody. I don't have to show you my ID. And of course, I had a little bit too much to drink. But nevertheless, he, uh, he tried to show me his ID, his ID, and I refused to look at it. Well, then he turned me in. Eventually, some of the other people that were in the bar told him who I was, and it got back into my CO, and it all went around and around. And my, uh, the overall commanding officer, which was Colonel Dobrat, said that, uh, I don't know what happened to you. You came back a squared away Marine, and you turned into instant defecation. Those weren't his words, but similar. And uh, the point being, I didn't... I didn't have any respect for them because I didn't have any respect for myself at the time. I was drinking like a fish. I was messed up, lots of issues. Um, and I don't want to make this about me, but I'm just saying this is natural stuff. It happens to everybody, you know. And I was, you know, I was struggling with what's right, what's wrong, what's true, what's false, what's, you know, what really should I be doing and what shouldn't I have been doing and all those kinds of things. So I had, I had everything going for me, but the one thing that really I really needed, uh -huh. and that was the Lord. Yes. And I wasn't in a place where I was willing to accept that. I was sure I could take care of it myself, just, mm -hmm. you know, given an opportunity, get enough mm -hmm. booze in me, you know, make one more rank, you know, or get discharged, something. Just somehow I could get it all together. I felt like I had it under control, right? But we need him to be whole, and to function at our highest capability, to be all that we were created to be, Absolutely. we have to accept him. Yes. Amen? Matthew chapter 4, verse 4. As a side note, I did get an honorable discharge. I got, I got office hours and I had a suspended, a suspended bus from sergeant to corporal from E5 to E4. And... Uh, I got taken out of the, my actual job description and I got put in charge of Navy supply. I was in the Marine Corps, but I had to work in Navy supply because it was the only place that there weren't any other military people. <laughs> they were all civilians. And I, for the last four or five months that I was in the service, all I did was change light bulbs in a warehouse. All day, that's all I did. 
because I refused to train these new recruits in terms of just marching them. I told them, I said, this is BS, you know, I mean, come on, I've already been there, I'm back. You don't need me to be marching these guys around on a parade field. You know? Well, they felt like they did, and since they were in charge, I, I just had the feeling that it didn't make much difference. I what are you going to do, shave my head and send me to Vietnam? <laughs> We've already been there and already done that, so you don't have anything to threaten me with anymore, you know. I was, anyway, I, I was very rebellious. And they sent, my whole point in all that was they sent me to a psychologist, a psychiatrist, because this was so out of norm for me, from my record. I'd been in over three years, I'd been in Vietnam, I'd done, I hadn't had any issues, I'd, everything was squared away, and then all of a sudden it was like, this guy flipped out here somehow. So they sent me to this uh, psychiatrist, a Navy doctor, and uh, of course they did the whole evaluation and everything, and, and decided I had a passive aggressive personality disorder. <laughs> I said, no, I just been in the Marine Corps for three and a half years. I mean, come on, that's what you get. You have to obey, you have to be passive to some degree in order to exist there. You can, I mean, you can't, come on, if you, anybody been in the military, you know, you don't get to be aggressive with everybody. Right. You get to be aggressive with those who are under you. Yeah. And then only to the degree that you're helping them because if you become a detriment to them, then you're, you're a problem for everybody, right? So the passive aggressive was really just a question of me get sick of being given orders that were idiotic, yeah. amen, yeah. and then responding to it, mm -hmm. which is what you don't do in the military if you plan on being in there for very long. But I didn't care at that point. Now remember, this is 1969. It's not like they were waving flags and having parades for us. Right. <laughs> you know, we were the most hated creatures on the planet. Mm. So anyway, that was my point about the psychiatry. There wasn't anything wrong with me that, that, I, that wasn't wrong with me before I came to the Marine Corps is my point. Right. It's just that I didn't care anymore. Mm -hmm. At that point, I didn't care if they liked it or they didn't like it. I kept myself in check till I got to the place where I just didn't care. Right. And that, at that point, I had started developing my own way of living. Mm -hmm. I mean, they control you. They have complete control over everything that you do. And I got to the place where I thought, not anymore. Yeah. I just don't care. I'm gonna, I've got my own thing going here, and I'm gonna work it out somehow. So he answered and said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Praise the Lord. So everybody wants security. Everybody wants significance. Everybody wants purpose. Everybody, the truth is, everybody craves a happy life, a good life, a satisfying life. Amen? Unless they're neurotic or something, you know. So Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. I know you've all lost complete respect for me now because of my behavior. But as I said, I got an honorable discharge. Everything's good. And we're just trying to figure out what happened to this wacko. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. Take, therefore, no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. All right? Seek first the kingdom of God, his righteousness. All these things will be added unto you. His righteousness, his way of doing things, right? Look at Romans chapter 10 and verse 3. <clears throat> For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. So you could, you could say it this way with the other translation of his way of doing things. For they being ignorant of God's way of doing things go about to establish their own way of doing things. And because of that, they don't submit themselves to God's way of doing things. Sure. Seek first God's way, and all the other stuff gets added. Seek your own way of doing it. You've got to provide all those other things, because yeah. you're not going to get them from God that way. Right. Amen? So we build our own kingdoms. Sure. Everybody builds a kingdom. Everybody. Yeah. Think, just think of a kingdom as a way of organizing life. It's a way to make sense of the world, sure. to make it seem rational, right? Matthew chapter 4, 
verses 8 through 10. Again, the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. And he said unto them, All these things will I give thee if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Then saith Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. It's kind of the same thing that we're talking about. Satan is saying, Hey, I'll give you a human kingdom. I'll give you one that we design, yeah. that we set up, and all the good stuff that can come with it. Mm -hmm. That's what I thought I had. All the booze I wanted. Different woman. Yeah. Drugs. Freedom. Whatever I thought freedom was. You know, that kind of, we're setting them up. Just trying to create my own kingdom mm. that would satisfy me. Sure. For the moment. Amen. <laughs> so, kingdom is, is a way of living. It's a way that we set up and, and run it ourselves. One that we have control over. Uh -huh. See, I didn't want the Marine Corps kingdom anymore. Right. I wanted my own. I wanted the one that I controlled, the one that I run. It's true with all of us in some degree. So in a personal kingdom, we're in control. Uh -huh. And we like it that way. Sure we, do. We, we like it that way. Yeah. I'm looking right at you. We, we do, praise the Lord. If I can just get enough money, uh -huh. right? If, uh, if I can get a good reputation or I can be renowned somehow or famous or whatever, if I can get the right relationship, no matter how many I gotta go through to find it, just uh -huh. somehow I'll, I'll, I'll get the right one, right? If I could just be important, uh -huh. significant. If I could just win, be the winner. If I could just have influence, get the right job. Not just a job, but the right job. That's how we articulate a kingdom, humanly. Yeah. That's what we think the kingdom is. And once we've got this idea in our head, we, we begin to construct a kingdom. And once we've constructed the kingdom, then we cling to it. And then we defend it. It's mine, it's the right way, or the highway. Mm -hmm. Amen? Matthew chapter 7, verse 24 through 27. See, this is the battle that goes on in each one of us. Yeah. Between what God wants and what we want. Mm -hmm. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. Or we could say in this case, kingdom. The rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat upon that kingdom and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. It's God's kingdom. Right? right? And everyone that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not shall be likened unto a foolish man which builds his kingdom upon sand. Yes. And the rain descends and the floods come and the wind blows and beats upon that kingdom, and it falls, and great will be the fall of it. Mm -hmm. So, our kingdom works for a while, mm -hmm. because it seems like it's giving us what it is we want. Mm -hmm. But then, our constructed, controlled world eventually crumbles and falls apart. Yeah. How many of y'all have been there? Yeah. How many had a kingdom you thought was the answer? The one you really figured, I got control over this. I can make it work. And for a little while, it seemed like it. Uh -huh. And then it comes crashing down. Well, the truth is our kingdoms never last. No. And you may have 50 kingdoms in a lifetime yeah. before you get to the kingdom. Right. It's true. But ours never last because they can't. Right. They're built on earthly values that disintegrate. Dependent on other people. Yes. The carnal mind, the scripture says, is at enmity with God. It means it's opposite or opposes God. His way of doing things. It doesn't have to be evil. It's just carnal. It's just unlimited. I mean, it's just limited. It's just human. 
It's just different than God's way. And life changes. Mm -hmm. And the longer you live, the more it changes. Mm -hmm. And it changes because of choices. Mm -hmm. Choices we make, choices that others make. Sure. Because of difficulties, because of tragedies, because of accidents, because of pressure. And that's usually when the kingdom's weakness and frailty gets exposed. Sure, yeah. sure. That's when we go, this ain't working. Something's wrong with this. To really make life work the way it's intended to work, abundant life, mm -hmm. we have to exchange our kingdom for God's kingdom. Yes. And that requires a change that the Bible calls repentance. Mm -hmm. Change your mind. Yeah. Change the way you're thinking, the way you're doing things. And here's the deal with religion. Religion is an attempt to include God without giving up our control. Right. Include God in our kingdom. Yeah. True. <laughs> Amen. That's exactly right. It's still about us doing stuff. Uh -huh. Something we're doing that's making us feel good about ourselves. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's being delivered from the kingdom of darkness, but not truly entering into the kingdom of light. It's having eyes to see, but still not seeing. Mm -hmm. Say, born again, got the eyes, but right. I'm not using them. Yeah. Right? Yeah. You can't take your kingdom with you into God's kingdom. No. We can't just add God's kingdom to ours. It doesn't work. No. It won't work. Look at Revelation chapter 11 and verse 15. I'm talking about us moving into a new year yes. because all of us are still dragging some of our kingdom yes. along with us. And the sooner we get rid of it, the sooner things will really begin yes. to dramatically change yes. in our lives. Yes. Doesn't mean we're not saved. It just means we're not able to access yes. the kingdom, his way of doing things yes. in a way that will add all those other things to us. We're trying to add our stuff to his or his to ours, uh -huh. so we think we're getting the best of both worlds, and the truth is we're getting neither. Right. The seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven saying, the kingdoms of this world, that'd be ours, yeah. are become the kingdoms of our Lord. This is the ultimate plan of God. Yes, it is. And of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. He, his is an eternal kingdom. Ours is temporal. They come and they go. This is why grace is so amazing. Why it's so significant. It's the only way to exchange our kingdom for God's kingdom. It has to be by grace. Mm -hmm. Look at Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 28. This just reminds me of an old Rod Stewart song. I wish that I knew now. Yeah. I wish that I knew then what I know now. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Yeah. Life would have been a whole lot easier and a lot less painful. Not just for me, but for a lot of people. Wherefore, we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. See, the only way to get this kingdom exchange is by grace. Uh -huh. Matthew 11, 11 through 15. This Jesus is, actually talks about this over and over in the scripture, but we don't really see it most of the time because most, most of the time, and at least much of the time, we're looking at it from religious kind of, way of looking at this stuff. Uh -huh. But here Jesus is talking about John the Baptist, who was a prophet under the old covenant, under where man still influenced. In other words, you had to keep the law. It was about your do-gooding. Uh -huh. You know, you had your own kingdoms to operate. And so God, Jesus says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, among them that are born of women, there hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist. Notwithstanding, he that is least in the kingdom of heaven, or in God's kingdom, 
is greater than he. He was the greatest in the man's kingdom, in the human realm where man controlled and, and, and right. developed, you know. He was the greatest. But in the kingdom of God, he's nothing. Uh -huh. He is the very least. And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and the violent take it by force. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. What did they prophesy? They prophesied this coming kingdom mm -hmm. of God, which they couldn't enter. They could just right. talk about it. And he, if you will receive it, this is Elijah, which was for to come. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. Amen? So John was the last of the old covenant law-keeping prophets, least in God's kingdom. The least in God's kingdom is greater than the greatest in any man's kingdom. Mm -hmm. Praise the Lord. Matthew 11, 28 through 30. I mean, I'm saying this, but I'm just throwing stuff in there, okay? For example, you've been forgiven massively. Mm -hmm. Anything and everything you've ever done or ever could do will not change God's love for you. That's right. You have been forgiven, past, present, future. But do you forgive? Right. If you don't, you're trying to mess Two kingdoms here. Uh -huh. And I'm telling you, I believe there's some stuff we're going to have to deal with this coming year. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to say this, I don't care if it's on the internet or not, but Mike is one of them. Mm -hmm. Praise yes. the Lord. Let me just say this. Whatever happened, and I don't know that any of us will ever know for sure. God has forgiven. Yes. Yep. Amen. You say, well, that, nah, wait a minute. No. Exactly. God has forgiven. Either, either he has or else he's a liar. Amen. His love has not changed. Doesn't change our reality. But it should change our response to it. And I'm just using that as an example because it's an extreme, but it's still the truth. Amen. And if God's going to do what he wants to do in my life, in our lives collectively, amen. we need to be thinking about changing kingdoms here. Yes, amen. yes. We yes. need to be thinking about a serious yes. kingdom change. That's amen. right. And you can like it or not like it, and you can dislike me for saying it, but I'm just saying it because it's the truth. Exactly. And I'm just right. using that as one example, and there's plenty... I mean, in all of our lives, personally, this just happens to be one that we're all collectively involved in to some degree or another, right. simply because right. he's who he is. But we all got our own little That's right. crap, too. Yeah. All of us. Because oh, yes. everybody has a kingdom. Everybody builds kingdoms. I mean, that's yes. if you're human. Yes. Right? Yes. So come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Take, well, this is the same chapter where he tells us about the greatest in the kingdom or the least in the kingdom being greater mm -hmm. than the greatest in the previous kingdom or in man's kingdom. Mm -hmm. So he's saying, how? how? Come to me. All you that labor are heavy laden and I'll give you rest. I'll come to my kingdom yes. and I'll give you rest from that mess you're trying to create. Yes. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls. That word yoke, and I t we talked about this here a while back. Uh, Jesus said, through the scriptures, he said, be not unequally yoked with unbelievers. So he's telling us by that very statement that he is declaring us to be equal with him. Or we could not be yoked with him. This is powerful. I mean, this is huge. That's if you're in the kingdom. So take my yoke, learn to be. I'm meek and lowly in heart, and you'll find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Jesus wants to give us our lives back. Yes. The lives that we waste trying to establish our own kingdoms. Right. So true. Let's think about the, the negatives 
over your life. And I'm not trying to turn this into a, into a negative message, but I'm just trying to be real and be honest. Mm -hmm. The negatives in our life, they, were not, they never came from God. It was never God's judgment or correction or punishment or anything else. It was our choices. It was our kingdoms that we were trying to establish that created the problems. And so we say, your kingdom come, your will be done yep. on earth as it is in heaven. Now get this, we've talked about, I've talked about this before too, but the term earth includes us, yeah. our bodies, our minds, our souls, our emotions. Uh -huh. Adam was of the earth. He was earthy. The scripture says we have borne the image of the earthy. We will bear the image of the heavenly, right? Mm -hmm. God's will be done on earth means my earth. Your earth, not just the planet earth. Right. He's talking about people. He's not that concerned about an orb. He can create another one of those. The people is what he cares about. Yes. That's the earth that he's interested yes. in getting this kingdom to. Yes. John 8, verse 28 through 32. Now Jesus went about everywhere preaching the kingdom. Yes. Over and over and over, it tells us throughout the Gospels. Everywhere he went, he preached the kingdom of God. So Jesus said unto them, When you have lifted up the Son of Man, then shall you know that I am he, and that I do nothing of myself, but as my Father hath taught me, I speak these things. And he that sent me is with me. The Father hath not left me alone, for I do always those things that please him. As he spake these words, many believed on him. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, if you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Mm -hmm. So Jesus diagnoses the cause of our pain, the cause of our failure, our dysfunction, our despair, as a kingdom problem. Yes. Not a human problem, a kingdom problem. Not just because you're a man, you got these problems, but because you try to create your own kingdoms, that's where your problems is. If you'll... Follow me. If you'll pursue me, you'll find the truth. And that truth will set you free from this kingdom that's binding you and that's screwing you all up. Amen? Look at James uh, 1, 22 through 26. James 1, 22 through 26. So all of our issues, all of our problems, all of our dysfunction, all of our failed relationships, all of our stuff, and we all got them, and some of us have more than others, praise the Lord. I'm talking about me. Amen. The problem is kingdom oriented. It's a kingdom problem. And the more in charge you are yeah. of your kingdom, uh -huh. self-control, keep it in, you know, the bigger the problem becomes. Yeah. Be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, He's like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For beholdeth himself and goeth his way, and straightway forgets what manner of man he was. But whosoever looketh into the perfect law of liberty, and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this is a man, this man shall be blessed in his deed. For if any man among you seem to be religious, and bridleth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart, this man's religion is vain. This is what Tammy was talking about. Right? Words, works. The works that we do are the things that we say. It isn't physical actions that we take. Right. It's what we're saying. It's how we're defining things. Amen? So look at chapter 2 now, James, still James, chapter 2, verse 5. And he validates this. Hearken, my beloved brethren, hath not God chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith, heirs of the kingdom, which he has promised to them that love him, yeah. that seek his kingdom. Uh -huh. Mark 1, 15. Just a couple examples of repentance, okay? Jesus went about preaching. Times fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. Believe the good news, right? John chapter 3, verse 3. There's lots of them. I'm just giving you a couple here for the sake of time. John 3, 3 is the same thing. Jesus answered and said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. You've got to be spirit. You've got to operate spiritually, yes. right? So when Jesus uses the word repent, he's, it's as if he says, like he says to his disciples, Come follow me. 
Leave your, leave your kingdom, leave your nets, leave your defined kingdom, come follow me, right? So it's like he's saying, you can run your life as you fit, see fit, or you can change your mind and let me lead you. Yeah. You can repent and follow me. Yeah. Matthew 13, 10 through 15. disciples came and said unto him, Why speakest thou unto them in parables? And he answered and said unto them, Because it's given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it's not given. For whosoever hath, to him shall be given, and he shall have more abundance. But whosoever hath not, from him shall be taken away, even that he hath. Therefore speak I to them in parables, because they seeing, see not, and hearing, they hear not. Neither do they understand. And in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, which said, By hearing ye shall hear, and shall not understand, and seeing ye shall see, and shall not perceive. For this people's heart is wax gross, their ears are dull of hearing, their eyes they have closed, lest at any time they should see with their eyes, hear with their ears, and should understand with their heart, and should be converted, and I should heal them. Mm. Now he said a lot there, but what he really is saying here is everybody wrestles with control issues. Everybody wrestles with control issues at the heart level, at the very core yes. of what we are as human yes. beings. Everybody does. Yes. And Jesus knows that his message is threatening to us. If you're honest with yourself, when he's saying things like that, it's a threat because I'm going to lose control. Yes. I don't have control over his kingdom. Uh -huh. I only have control over my kingdom, which is a failure. So he knows that it's, it's threatening, but he doesn't hesitate to give it anyway. And he makes no apologies about it. Why? Because it's the right thing. It's the best thing. It's what's good for you. Yeah. Amen? God wants to establish his kingdom in our hearts. Mm -hmm. Amen? In John chapter 4, I'm not, you don't have to go there right for this whole thing, but it's a story about the Samaritan woman. It's a perfect example. This woman had five husbands, and the guy she was living with was not her husband. Mm -hmm. Jesus exposes it. Not to humiliate her, not to make her feel guilty, but just to let her know, I know what your problem is. I know your issue. I know your kingdom. Mm -hmm. Amen? And the kingdom she had was filled with shame. It was filled with self-guilt. It was filled with uh, no self-respect, right. no self-esteem. All the things in Maslow's hierarchy are laid out there for us. You know, it's almost like a psychology course yeah. when you read it, you know. You think, my God, what's going on here? She built her kingdom, and her kingdom, her significance, her esteem, her self-value, amen, her security, all these things trying to meet her needs, right, right. were based on her attractiveness to men. Uh -huh. How she could get them. And we don't need to define that. It's pretty obvious that we know how that works. Amen? So Jesus offers her the acceptance that she's really looking for. Right. She's just going to men because it's temporary, but it seems like it's going to satisfy whatever it is the issue is. Right. Her self-doubt, her self-esteem, her feeling inadequate, whatever it is. I've got to have somebody to validate me. Right. So I'll go to bed with this guy, and he'll say how wonderful I am till tomorrow morning, and then yeah. it'll be somebody else, and then somebody else, and somebody else. And so just, but that's the motive behind this. Mm -hmm. Amen? And again, I'm talking spiritual. I know it sounds psycho stuff, but I'm not trying to give you psycho battle. I'm telling you what the scripture is actually saying. And it's just a, a, almost a miracle that psychology has actually picked up on some of this stuff. Of course, they've taken it all in the wrong direction, but nevertheless, the truth is still there. That's what's happening with her. And then Jesus just offers her the acceptance, the security, the love, yeah. the forgiveness, the esteem, uh -huh. the self-worth, amen, the kingdom of God yes. is what he's offering her in place of her kingdom. Yes. The water so that she'll never thirst again. Yes. Water that will satisfy, that isn't just a one-night stand, that isn't just somebody yes. that's going to be talking about you tomorrow. Yes. Right? 
Somebody that loves you. Somebody that actually cares yes. about your life, about your future, about your Amen. reality. Amen. Yes. Jesus tells her there's a kingdom to let go of in order to receive this kingdom. Yes. Well, Jesus offers that woman the satisfaction that she looked for all of her life. The source of belonging, uh -huh. the security of acceptance, God himself, his kingdom. Uh -huh. You know, technically, repent means to change sides. From Jesus' perspective, repentance marks the arrival of God's kingdom. Yeah. That's true repentance. Change in sides. Uh -huh. Think of the prodigal son. These stories are all through the Bible, but in Luke 15, it's so glaringly obvious that the prodigal's kingdom was one of debauchery, yeah. drunkenness, mm -hmm. revelry, women, da 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 da, right? He had it figured out. If I get enough money, mm -hmm. I can have my kingdom. And it's the kingdom for me. Party hearty. Like it's 1999 every day. Right? Just do it. Get another girl. Get another girl. Have another drink. Do another thing. Go to another party. Do it. Do it. Do it. It's going to be great. It's going to satisfy all of my desires. All of my needs. It's going to give me value. It's going to give me a sense that I'm needed. People want me. These women got to have me, you know. And, and just all the guys are going to be my buddy because we're drinking and partying and going on and on and on. It's just going to be fantastic. What a life. Yeah, bro. Yeah. And it looked good for a while. Sure. Or he wouldn't have stayed. But it ended up in a pig pen. Yeah. With nothing. But garbage that the pigs didn't even eat. Right. So he lets go of it. He changes his mind. He changes sides and he comes home to God's kingdom. Yeah. And what does God do? Okay. Welcome home. Uh -huh. Welcome to the kingdom that was always yours. Exactly. And look at the older brother. Because we always think of this as being about the younger brother. Right? But look at Luke chapter 15, Sheila, 29 through 32. 15, 29 through 32. He answering said to his father, Lo, these many years do I serve thee. Neither transgressed I at any time. In other words, he's comparing himself with his brother's kingdom. He's comparing his kingdom with brother's kingdom. Right? I've been here all along. I've, I've been working like a dog. Neither have I ever transgressed at any time your commandment. And yet, you never gave me a kid. You never gave me a goat, a feast, a party, you know, right? That I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this thy son was come, which hath devoured thy living with harlots, thou hast killed for him the fatted calf. And he said unto him, Son, thou art ever with me. I've always been here. And everything that I've got is yours. Mm -hmm. Right? My kingdom's right here. It was available to you. It was meet that we should make merry and be glad. For this thy brother was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Now Jesus doesn't even go on to finish the story. It ends with this older brother, angry, bitter, full of self-pity. Amen. His kingdom is payback. His kingdom is revenge. Yeah. His kingdom is get even, right? See, it's possible to be forgiven, but unforgiving. That's the moral of this. That's the reality of what he's trying to tell us. That's a man's kingdom where you can have forgiveness sure. and everything's available to you, but you won't forgive. Yeah. You can't forgive. That's why I said what I said about Mike. That's just one example. And you can, you can give me every moral argument you want, but it won't stand up in the court of law of God. It won't stand up in His kingdom. Amen. And that's just, again, that's just one example. Because I'm, I'm telling you, God wants to restore the kingdom. Yes. He wants to restore us to the kingdom. Yes. But we've got to let go of ours 
in order to receive it, in order to have all those other things added to us. Yes. Yes. we got to operate the way God operates. It, goes, it's, it, it, it coincides with the saying what he says. Yes. But it's also acting mm -hmm. on what he has said. Yes. Now, you don't have to like it. The guy didn't ask him to love your brother. He just said, you got to forgive. Yeah. This stuff's all here for you. But you've got to receive it. Mm -hmm. Amen? Amen. What, so what happens with the older brother? For the rest of his life, his relationship with his brother is shot. Mm -hmm. His relationship with his father is shot. And that's going to affect all kinds of other relationships. Sure. Matthew 11, 11 again. Now think of this prodigal mentality and, and the Samaritan woman mentality in these scriptures because that's what we need to connect them together. It's line upon line, precept upon precept. It isn't just grab a scripture over here and then, you know, try to create a doctrine or a denomination or something around. But he says, Verily I say unto you, among them that are born of woman, there has not risen a greater than John the Baptist, notwithstanding he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than anybody in their own kingdom, no matter how good it looks. They're still the least mm -hmm. compared, or there's still nobody compared to the very least of them that are in God's kingdom. Yes. All right, verse 28 through 30 again. Jesus is showing us the prodigal. What's he saying? Come on back. Mm -hmm. Come unto me. Answer and said, look, no. Uh, 28 and 30, yeah, still it's Matthew. Matthew 11, 28 and 30. And it's, it's just Jesus saying the same thing. He's the father here. He's the picture of the father and the prodigal son. Mm -hmm. Come unto me, all you that labor, heavy laden. I'll give you rest from your kingdom. Mm -hmm. You're working like a fool trying to create something that just isn't going to ever last. It's never going to manifest in a way that's going to be beneficial to you. Take my yoke. Hook up with me. My way of doing things. Because if you're yoked with him, you've got to do it his way, right? You gotta, you're going to be walking with him the way he goes. Learn of me. I'm meek and lowly in heart, and you'll have, find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. So Jesus connects our inner peace, yes. our heart's issues, our core issues, yes. with re-entry to heaven's realm. Yes. To yes. getting back to the kingdom. He went everywhere preaching the kingdom of heaven. He did. Now, look, when you read this, he talks like we already know about the kingdom. It's as if he knows the message of the kingdom, this good news, will connect to a needy place in us uh -huh. that will res resonate with us. It'll, it'll go... Wow, that's what I'm looking for. That's, that's what I'm after. That's what I really need. That's what I'm really wanting. It's our homesickness for our spiritual birthplace. Uh -huh. It's the prodigal son waking up and saying, wow, if I could get back uh -huh. to that. It's in our subconscious. Somehow it's in us to know that there yes. is a God yes. and that he's got something really good for us. Yes. We just got to figure out how to let go of the thing that's keeping us from it. Yeah. He presents heaven as our real home. Yes. And that explains our need subconsciously as humans to try to establish kingdoms. Sure. Before we're born again, and then that carries over after we're born again. We're longing for what's lost. We're trying to create the idyllic Eden. But because we're not thinking the way God thinks, right. we try to find ways that satisfy the flesh, thinking that's what it is I'm after. Mm -hmm. Enough money, the right car, right. the right house, the right woman, the right job, the, the, this, the, that. And there's not anything wrong with those things in and of themselves. But when we make them uh -huh. our kingdom, mm -hmm. they crumble, they fall, they, 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 they become detrimental to us. We try to shape our environment we try to reconstruct the reality 
of heaven that's buried in our subconscious. But we try to do it naturally instead of spiritually. That's why we have to seek first the kingdom of God and his way of doing things. Because our way fails Amen. miserably. Luke chapter 17, verse 20 and 21. I'm not, I hope I'm not depressing you this morning. I'm just saying, we got a new year. Let's, let's do things new. I mean, why keep yeah. beating the same dead horse? Why do we keep doing the same thing, thinking it's going to give us a different result? Right. When he was demanded of the Pharisees when the kingdom of God should come, he answered them and said, The kingdom of God cometh not with observation, neither shall they say, Lo here or lo there. For behold, the kingdom of God is in you. Mm -hmm. Praise the Lord. Mm -hmm. So here's what's happening. Without spiritual intervention, we set up inferior kingdoms. Sure we because we're avoiding the kingdom where we really have dominion and authority and trying to create a man-made kingdom and then try to operate with dominion and authority there, which we don't have. Right. We only have it in His kingdom. Yes. Yes. It makes us controllers. In the natural realm. It makes us manipulative. It makes us obsessive. Uh -huh. Because we're doing it our way. In his kingdom, we have authority. We have, we have dominion. Based on his way of doing things. By the word of God. In agreement with the word of God. Not just to satisfy my own hunger or thirst or lust or whatever it might be. And all those things aren't bad in and of themselves. That's what, I, what I'm saying. But the problem is... Operating outside of his kingdom, they be, we become obsessive about them. And ultimately, they will fail because they're based on human value and not God's. I'll show, you, I'll show you an example. Look at Galatians chapter 4, 4 through 11. When the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. And because you're sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Wherefore, thou art no more a servant, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. Howbeit then, when you knew not God, you did service unto them which by nature are no gods. But now, after that you have known God, or rather are known of God, I'll turn you again. Now, this is talking about kingdom. You see it. You're not, you're not in that kingdom anymore. You're in God's kingdom. You are a son now. Right? Yep. So why do you want to go back to your kingdom? Right. But now after that, you have known God, or rather are known of God. How, why turn again to the weak and beggarly elements whereunto you desire again to be in bondage? You observe days, months, times, and years. Look at this. I'm afraid. I'm afraid of you. You scare me. That mm -hmm. I might have taught you with no good purpose as a result or no good outcome. Mm -hmm. Why? Because the things that I taught you aren't going to do you any good if you continue to try to develop them within your own kingdom. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Think about it now. Look at verse 22 and 23 here. And here's the outcome of this. God told Abraham, everywhere you go, mm -hmm. he's saying, it's a kingdom. You have authority. It's yours. It belongs to you. What's Abraham do? God gives him a promise. You're going to have a child. Does he go by God's kingdom way of doing things? God's way of doing things? Mm -hmm. By faith? No. He has his own kingdom way of doing things. So he takes what God said and he tries to right. force it into his kingdom. Yeah. And what happens? It's written that Abraham had two sons, one by a bondmaid, the other by a free woman. But he who was of the bondwoman was born after the flesh, or after man's kingdom. Uh -huh. But he of the free woman was by promise. Yeah. He produced something, but it ended up being a horrible mess, and still is to this day. Yes. Why? Because it came out of man's kingdom and not God's kingdom. But here's the good news. Look at Hebrews 11. 33. Who 
through faith subdued kingdoms. This is talking about Abraham and other believers, right? Who through faith subdued kingdoms or put down kingdoms, right? Wrought righteousness or God's way of doing things. And because of that, obtained promises and stopped the mouths of lions. Yes. Praise the Lord. Despite all of our misdirection, Jesus promises we can begin again. Yes. Wow. No matter how screwed up you've done it yes. with your kingdom, exactly. you can start over. Yes. You can start again and get the promise, get the kingdom of God, and all those things will be added to you. We can recover the destiny that Jesus invites us to find through him. The door to peace mm -hmm. that passes understanding. Galatians, Galatians 4.11. Again here, praise the Lord. I'm afraid of you, lest I have bestowed upon you. I'm afraid, amen. So we can abandon our man-made crumbling kingdoms filled with fear, filled with doubt, Feared with disappointment mm -hmm. and dysfunction. And replace them with God's kingdom of peace. Which is the only real antidote for fear. Mm -hmm. Praise the Lord. You can blow all you want to and talk loud and be aggressive and all that stuff. But you're still afraid or you wouldn't be doing it. The way you get away with, do away with fear. Is to enter into the peace yes. of God that yes. passes understanding. John 14, 27. Just a couple more scriptures and we'll wrap up here. Praise the Lord. John 14, 27. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world gives, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled. Neither let it be afraid. Matthew 6, 25 through 33, where we started. Praise the Lord. Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what you shall eat, what you shall drink, or your body. What you shall put on is not life more than meat, and the body than raiment. Behold the fowl of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are you not much better than they? Which of you, taking thought, can add one cubit to his stature? And why take ye thought of her raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, they toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which is today, which today is, and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall not he, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore, take no thought, saying, What shall we eat? What shall we drink? Or wherewithal shall we be clothed? What's going to satisfy me? Take no thought about what will satisfy you, what will give you peace, what will give you your kingdom. Amen. But after all these things do the Gentiles seek. Gentiles there just, just uh, identifies unbelievers. Mm -hmm. For your heavenly Father knows that you have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God, his way of doing things, and all these things yeah. will be added. Okay, so back to where we started. Maslow's hierarchy tells us we need to, be, to reach our potential, to, to, to become what we're supposed to be as humans. Uh -huh. We need love. We need acceptance. We need belonging. Yes. But he can't tell us how to get it. He can just tell us what we need. Right. Jesus understands this human quest for love and acceptance because he was here yeah. in the flesh. They're powerful forces in the human psyche. This is what, it's what it's all about. It's what causes people to marry. It's what causes people to murder. It's what yes. causes people to, to do all the things that they do. It's the motivation behind it all. Yeah. God knows that in order to satisfy these needs, we have got to change sides. Uh -huh. Or we'll mess it all up. He's provided our total, complete forgiveness, acceptance, self-esteem. And he did it all at this humongous price. And God wants to meet all of our needs by introducing us again to his kingdom. Yes. To reintroduce us yes. to the Father's house, to the kingdom of God. Last scripture, Revelation 12, 9 through 11. The great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil, 
and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now has come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of the brethren is cast down, and which accused them before our God day and night. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. And they loved not their kingdoms unto death. Uh -huh. Our part is simple. You just leave your self-made kingdom uh -huh. of failure and dysfunction, and you step through the door of peace. He stands at the door and knocks, right? Into love, joy, victory. Mm -hmm. Into an everlasting kingdom. So I'm just saying this is the year to let go of your kingdom. Amen. To let your kingdom go. The year for God's kingdom to come on your earth as it is in heaven. Yes. And you're the only one that can make the decision. Yeah. Yes. He's there. He stands at the door. Uh -huh. Right? He's just waiting. For you to enter into his peace. Yeah. Enter into his way of doing things. Praise the Lord. Amen. Give him a hand clap this morning. Praise amen. God. Amen. Amen. God bless you. I'm believing for a great new year. Hey, it's a challenge. If it were easy, everybody would already be doing it. Jesus came and died so that we have the ability to do this. We just have to make a decision. Yeah. I'm sick of this kingdom. Yeah. I want his. Maybe you've given up, and most of us have given up much of our kingdom. Mm -hmm. But there's still bits and pieces that we cling to because it makes us feel like we still have some control. The just shall live by faith, not control. Mm -hmm. Faith in God's control over the situations of our lives. Yes. And that's where we achieve all the other things being added. Yes. Amen? Amen. I want this. I want it for me. I want it for all of us. Amen. That's the greatest influence we can have on this world around us, on our loved ones, on people, co-workers, mm -hmm. anybody we interact with. That's the greatest influence we'll ever be able to have because we'll be validating the very words of God by just believing it. It means we have to shut up to our own kingdom sometimes. Yeah. You know, your kingdom will come back to try to, you know. Look, I'll give you all this stuff, just like Satan did with Jesus, but he's been brought down. Uh -huh. Right? How did he come down? Jesus just said what God said. Uh -huh. Amen? He just spoke that kingdom of God yes. right into the face of this earthly kingdoms, and they fled. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. It's a challenge for each and every one of us, but we can do it Amen. because he that's in us is greater than he that's in the world. His kingdom is in you. Amen? It just needs to be released. Yes. Praise God. God bless all of you. Happy New Year. Have a great week. See you back here next Sunday. Expect some really good testimonies as a result of that. Peter, would you?